Excuse me, what do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Can the mind really heal the body? And if so, is there any scientific evidence to convince skeptical physicians like me? These are the questions that fueled the last few years of my research. And what I discovered is that the scientific community, the medical establishment, has been proving for over 50 years that the mind can heal the body. We call it the placebo effect. And we've been trying to outsmart it for decades. <laughs> The placebo effect is a thorn in the side of the medical establishment. It's an inconvenient truth that gets in between trying to bring new treatments, new surgeries into the medical establishment. So it's, it's a problem, supposedly. But I actually think this is really good news. The placebo effect is excellent news because it's concrete evidence that the body holds within it innate self-repair mechanisms that that can make unthinkable things happen to the body. So if you find this surprising, if you have a hard time believing that the body can heal itself, you need look no further than the Spontaneous Remission Project, a database compiled by the Institute of Noetic Sciences of over 3,500 case studies in the medical literature of patients who have gotten better from seemingly incurable illnesses. You think there's such a thing as an incurable illness? I, I swear, if you go look at this database, it's, it'll blow your mind. Everything's in there. Stage four cancers that disappeared without treatment. HIV positive patients that became HIV negative. Heart disease, kidney failure, diabetes, high blood pressure, thyroid disease, autoimmune diseases, gone. A great example of this in the case, uh, in the medical literature is a case study from 1957 of Mr. Wright who had advanced lymphosarcoma. So things weren't going well for Mr. Wright. Time was really running out. He had tumors the size of oranges in his armpits, his neck, his chest, his abdomen, his liver and his spleen were enlarged, and his lungs were filling up with two quarts of milky fluid every day that had to be drained in order for him to breathe. But Mr. Wright wasn't giving up hope. He had heard about this wonder drug called Krebiosin, and he was begging his doctor, come on, just give me some of that Krebiosin, it's all gonna be good. Now, unfortunately, the Krebiosin was only available on a research protocol, and the protocol required that the doctor be able to make an assessment that says that this guy has at least three months to live. And his doctor, Dr. West, just couldn't do that. But Mr. Wright was tenacious, and he didn't give up. He kept badgering his doctor, until finally his doctor was like, okay, fine, I'll give you the Krebiosin. So he dosed him up on a Friday, not expecting that Mr. Wright would make it through the weekend. But to his utter shock, when Dr. West came in to do rounds on Monday, Mr. Wright was up walking around the wards and his tumors had shrunk to half their original size. They had melted like snowballs on a hot stove, and 10 days after getting the Krebiosin, they were gone. So Mr. Wright was up rocking and rolling, like praising Krebiosin as the miracle drug he believed it to be for two months, until the initial reports came out about Krebiosin that said that it didn't really look like Krebiosin was working so well. And Mr. Wright fell into a deep depression, and his cancer came back. So this time, Dr. West decided to get sneaky, and he, he told his patient, that you know that Krebiosin that you got, that was a tainted version, really not so good. But I got us some ultra pure, highly concentrated Krebiosin. This stuff's got it going on. He then injected Mr. Wright with nothing but distilled water. And once again, the tumors disappeared. The fluid in his lungs went away. Mr. Wright was up rocking and rolling for another two months. And then the American Medical Association blew it by publishing a nationwide study that proved definitively Krebiosin was worthless. Two days later, Mr. Wright, after hearing this news, died. Soon after that, I came across another study in the medical literature that was the stuff of fairy tales. Three baby girls were born, delivered by a midwife on Friday the 13th in the Okefenokee Swamp near the Georgia-Florida border. And the midwife pronounced that these three babies born on such a fateful day were all hexed. The first, she said, would die before her 16th birthday. The second, before her 21st. The third, before her 23rd birthday. And as it turned out, the first girl died the day before her 16th birthday. The second died the day before her 21st birthday. And the third girl, who knew what had happened to the other two, got wind of that on the day before her 23rd birthday. She showed up at the hospital hyperventilating, begging them to make sure she survived. She wound up dying that night. So these two case studies are great examples from the medical literature of the placebo effect and its opposite, the nocebo effect. 
So Mr. Wright, when he got that distilled water and his tumors melted away, that's a great example of, of the placebo effect. When you get a seemingly inert treatment, and yet something's happening physiologically in the body, such that disease goes away. The nocebo effect is the opposite. So the three hexed girls are an example of the nocebo effect. When the mind's belief that something bad is going to happen in the body then comes to manifest. So the scientific literature, the medical journals like the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association, these scientific journals are full of evidence that the placebo effect and the nocebo effect are incredibly powerful. We've known this since the 1950s and we've seen countless case studies that show that in almost everything you study, if you give people a fake treatment, a sugar pill, a saline injection, or most effectively a fake surgery, 18, yeah, really, 18 to 80% of the time, people get better. And it's not just in their mind. That's what I thought in the beginning, like, oh, they're just feeling better, they're thinking better. But it's not, it's actually in their physiology. This is measurable. You can actually see what happens to the body. So for example, patients getting placebos were found to have ulcers that healed, colons that became less inflamed, bronchi that dilated, warts that disappeared, cells looked different under the microscope. It's provable, it's happening in the body, even though it's initiated by the mind. So when you, when you look at these, it, the, some of the studies are just amazing. I love the Rogaine study. So, you know, you get a bunch of bald men, you give them placebos, they grow hair. <laughs> the opposite is also true. So if you give people a placebo and you tell them it's chemotherapy, they vomit and they lose their hair. So this is really happening in the body. And the question that I had is, is it just the mind's positive belief that's making this happen? Not according to Harvard re researcher Ted Kapchick. According to him, he thinks that, it, that the most essential part is actually the nurturing care of a healthcare provider, more so even than the mind's positive belief. That some of the studies actually say the doctor is the placebo, or can be. So Ted Kapchick wanted to study this, and he did a great study looking at patients that were getting placebos for an illness, for treatment of an illness, and he told them, you're getting a placebo. There's nothing in here, inert ingredients, nothing active. They still got better. <laughs> Most likely, Kapchick postulated, because they felt tended, nurtured. They felt like they were doing something. They felt like somebody cared. So to say that you can heal yourself is sort of a misnomer. You know, the body can heal itself. The body has these innate natural self-repair mechanisms. But the scientific data proves that you need the, the tending, nurturing care of a healthcare provider of some sort, of a healer, to facilitate that process. It's not an easy process to go through alone. So it makes a big difference if somebody else is holding that positive belief with you. But the problem is, while the doctor can be the placebo, the doctor can also be the nocebo. So what patients need from us as healthcare providers, they need us to be forces of healing, not forces of fear or pessimism. So every time your doctor tells you you have an incurable illness, you're going to have to take that, that medication for the rest of your life. Or God forbid you get cancer and they say you've got a 5% five year survival rate. It's really no different than when that midwife told those three baby girls that they were hexed. It's a form of medical hexing that's so prevalent. As doctors, we think we're being realistic. You know, we're giving people the kind of information we think they need to know, but we actually can be harming them. Instead, we need to be more like Dr. West. You know, taking that distilled water. Really, Mr. Wright, I promise. This is gonna do it for you. But do we have to count on our doctors to dupe us? You know, do we have to get fake surgeries and fake drugs and wind up in clinical trials? This is what led the next phase of my research. So in my last TEDx talk, I talked about a new wellness model that I developed called the Whole Health Cairn. And this came about as part of my research, trying to find how else can we harness this mind's power that's clearly evidenced by the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. Can we do something without being in a clinical trial? And my hypothesis was that in order to heal ourselves, in order to be optimally healthy, we need more than just a good diet, a, a regular exercise program, getting enough sleep, taking your vitamins, following your doctor's orders. Those things are all great and critical, important. But I also came to believe that we need healthy relationships, a healthy professional life, 
a healthy creative life, a healthy spiritual life, a healthy sex life, a healthy financial life, a healthy environment. In essence, we need a healthy mind. So I wanted to try to prove this. And I, I went into the medical literature and the copious data that I found proving that all of those things are essential really blew my mind. They, I compiled them all into my upcoming book, Mind Over Medicine, Scientific Proof You Can Heal Yourself. But I want to give you a few highlights about what, I, what this is all about. So you can see from the whole health cairn that all of these facets are built upon a foundation stone that I call your inner pilot light. And for me, that's that essential, authentic part of you that knows what's true for you, that's willing to tell you the truth about maybe what's out of alignment in your life, what stones in your whole health care might be out of balance. And as you see, I've put the body, physical health, on the top of the whole health care because it's the most fragile, the most precarious, and the most easy to kind of fall out of balance if other things in your life aren't going so well. So what I found in the medical data is that relationships matter. People who have a strong social network have half the rate of heart disease compared to those who are lonely. Married people are twice as likely to live long lives than unmarried people. In fact, curing your loneliness may be the most important measure of prevention you can enact upon your body, more so than quitting smoking or starting to exercise. Your spiritual life matters. Those who attend religious services live up to 14 years longer. Your professional life matters. You really can work yourself to death. In Japan, they call it kuroshi, death by overwork. And people who survive, um, those, the survivors of those who die of kuroshi can actually apply for workman's comp-like benefits in Japan. But it's not just Japan, it's actually happening even more in the United States. We just don't get benefits here. So they found, they did one study and they found that people who fail to take their vacation are actually a third more likely to get heart disease. Your attitude really matters. Happy people live seven to 10 years longer than unhappy people. And optimists are 77% less likely to get heart disease than pessimists. So how does this happen? What's happening in the brain that's making the body change? This was what was fascinating to me. What I found is that the brain communicates with all the cells in the body via hormones and neurotransmitters. So for example, if you have a negative thought, belief, or feeling in the brain, it's, your brain triggers this as a threat. Something's wrong. If you feel lonely or pessimistic, things are bad at work, you're in a toxic relationship, the amygdala says threat, threat, threat. And it turns on the hypothalamus that talks to the pituitary gland, that communicates with the adrenal gland, and the adrenal gland starts spitting out stress hormones like cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine. It turns on what Walter Cannon at Harvard called the stress response that triggers the parasympathetic, excuse me, the sympathetic nervous system and puts you into that fight or flight mode, you know, which is adaptive, it's protective if you're running away from a mountain lion, you know. But in everyday life, you're supposed to have that quick stress response if there's a threat and then it's supposed to switch right off. This isn't what happens in our regular lives these days. But fortunately, there's a counterbalancing relaxation response that Herbert Benson at Harvard described. And when this comes about, the stress response turns off, the parasympathetic nervous system turns on, and healing hormones like oxytocin, dopamine, nitric oxide, endorphins, fill the body and bathe every cell in the body. What I found the most amazing about this is that those natural self-repair mechanisms that we all have, they only flip on when the nervous system is relaxed. So when you're having stress responses, the, the that all those natural self-repair mechanisms get flipped off. The body's too busy trying to fight or flee in order to heal itself. So when, when you think about this, you have to start to wonder, like, how can I possibly start to change the balance in my own body? So one study showed that on average, we have more than 50 stress responses per day. And if you're lonely or depressed or pessimistic or unhappy at work or in a miserable relationship, that number is going to be more than twice as many. Now, this is the relaxation response is what researchers think explains the placebo effect. So when you're going to get supposedly maybe a new wonder drug, you don't know whether you're getting the placebo or not, it triggers that relaxation response, that combination of the mind's positive belief and the nurturing care of a healthcare provider relaxes the nervous system. And then all those natural self-repair mechanisms can come into play.